Hello, Facebook friends. It's Sean Bishop of Bishop Instruments and Bows, coming to you live today from Windsor, and I'm here with my trusty companion Mop, who's um, was very animated a minute ago, but now he's just relaxing. Right, today we're talking about the greatest 20th century bow maker, Eugène Nicolas Sartori. Like most of the uh, late 19th century, early 20th century bow makers, he was also born in Mirecourt in France and then moved to Paris at age, well, he learned with his father first of all, um, although we don't know of his father's own personal work. He then moved to Paris, aged about 15, 16, worked with Charles Picard for two years, with Lamy for, I think, sort of two years, and then set up aged 18 on his own. Um, so from about nine, uh, 1889, he started with his own shop. And then from about 1900, uh, during this time, he was making bows for other people. And I'm going to get to a little bit more about what to look for on a Sartre bow in a minute. Just get a bit of the history out of the way. He um, always had people helping him work from 1900 onwards. So there were people roughing out the sticks. And then from the second, after the, sorry, after the First World War, he then employed some other bow makers to help him, like Morisot Père, um, Jules Fatigue, and Louis Gillet. Now, we can quickly talk about Sartre about the actual bow itself. So this bow here, we're looking at uh, a bow made in about 1925, and 1920, 1925, with original lapping. So on a Sartre, if you want to find original lapping, you will see the blue stripy silk. So this is uh, silk lapping, so it's quite light. So bows from that period didn't always have silver. That silk was quite common. So this bow, I think, weighs about 57. If you change that with silver, it would bring it to 61 grams. Um, okay, so the heads of Sartre bows, this is a typical example of Sartre's usual work that we see from about 1910 onwards when his, um, his style is completely fixed now. Um, I always think it's a bit like a, a question mark. So when you look at the, you see what I mean, it just sort of curves back that way. Yeah, that way. Um, also, to, to tell you a little about his bow making, what made him one of the greatest was his attention to detail. Um, he often... People were forging his bows, people were making copies, and there was a great um, court case in the 1920s, and he states to the judge about his bow making activities, and that's where we recently found out he was making 25 bows a week. So every orchestra in the world you go to these days, I've got a Sartre, that person's got a Sartre. I kept wondering how on earth could that be possible, but it was possible because he had all these people making bows for him, but he kept his attention to detail so high. So the quality of Sartre's work is extremely high. He's one of the bow makers that, as dealers, we can almost purchase without um, playing. I don't need to really try because you always know they're quite strong sticks. Um, he stamped, had two stamps, but his first, second stamp was the usual one we all know, the small E Sartori A Paris. Often it is stamped underneath the lapping as well, so you might find that there. That's one way of finding out if your bow is a Sartre, it helps. Um, also, later on his work from about 1930 onwards gets heavier in style, so a bit chunkier, lot, lots more octagonal bows. That was when uh, Gillet was working for him mainly. And um, the sticks become lighter. So the early sticks, I like personally the Sartre bows from about 1900 to 1910, where they're a little bit dark sticks and they remind me a little bit of Lamy. There's a bit more sort of finesse, but after that period they become quite strong. And like I said, they're, they're a, a bow that all players want. Um, for, for interest's sake, there's a very small margin when you're selling a Sartre bow because everybody knows the price of these things, so very hard to get them cheap, very hard to make any profit on them. So. I can assure you, anyone going to a shop to buy one, whatever the price is now, nobody's getting rich on a Sartre bow, except maybe when Sartre was making 25 a week himself. Okay, um, I will post a picture of this bow. Um, it's not mine, it's a customer's I sold to uh, a few years ago. He left it with me just recently, of course, now we're in lockdown, I'll have to give it to him some other time, um, with the original lapping, but I'll put photos below this post. If you have any questions, please ask me, and I'll try and answer them on this post. Anyway, have a great week and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.